All right, it's good to see everyone. Uh, I'm thankful that we live in a free country where we're allowed to uh, come and free, uh, worship freely. And through a lot of circumstances uh, in the outside, um, some government officials are trying to take away that freedom for us, so let's uh, enjoy it while we can. Let's all uh, stand and sing number 250. Number 250, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. We'll sing all three. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very Barker will bring us uh, the lesson the Lord has laid on his heart. Uh, dear Lord and Holy Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I uh, thank you for the free country we live in and all the freedoms and liberty we can enjoy. Lord, I pray that you'd put your hand upon it and bless us, Lord. I pray that you'd bless this um, lesson, Lord, as um, uh, you've laid on it on uh, Brother Barker's heart. Lord, I pray that it touch us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Everybody get a handout, the notes? Everybody got one? All right, 2 Kings. Moving right along. And this morning we're in 2 Kings. The theme is the judgment of God. And as we study uh, 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles, we certainly see some similarities to the day we're living in. You know, nations come and go, and even Israel couldn't escape the judgment of God. The key verses, in my opinion, are 2 Kings 17, verses 13 and 14. 2 Kings 17, verses 13 and 14. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I command your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks, like to the necks of their fathers, that did not believe in the Lord their God. So God was patient with them, and he sent them many prophets, to warn them, but they were hard, had hard necks, stiff necks, and they just wouldn't believe the Lord and wouldn't turn from their wicked ways. From the Schofield Study Bible, I copied this. This book continues 
the history of the kingdoms, now of course kingdoms plural, meaning primarily Israel and Judah, but of course it also talks about some of the other nations that surrounded Israel and Judah, but talking about basically Israel and Judah. The book continues the history of the kingdoms to the captivities. It includes the translation of Elijah and the ministry of Elisha. During this period, Amos and Hosea prophesied in Israel, and Obadiah, Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah in Judah. So there are a lot of prophets who lived during this period, and they heard a lot of preaching and a lot of warnings, but as we have noted, they didn't heed the warnings. They didn't respond to God's message to repent and turn from their wicked ways. Second Kings is in seven parts. Here's the outline from Schofield's uh, study Bible. Seven part outline. The last ministry and translation of Elijah. Of course, translation I mean when he went up into chariots of fire and so on. The ministry of Elisha. Of course, Elisha uh, uh, succeeded Elijah. The ministry of Elisha from the translation of Elijah to the anointing of Jehu. Because Jehu, we'll say more about him in a few minutes. He's a very fascinating character. God used him to judge the house of Ahab, but Jehu wasn't even saved. So God used an unsaved man. And, of course, that's a lesson. God can use unsaved people to carry out his will. But anyway, so uh, that, that uh, takes us to the anointing of Jehu. Number three, the reign of Jehu over Israel, chapters 9 and 10. Uh, next, the reigns of Athaliah and Jehoash over Judah. Then the reigns of Jehoahaz and Joash over Israel and the last ministry of Elisha. Then from the death of Elisha to the captivity of Israel. Then from the accession of Hezekiah to the captivity of Judah. So that takes us to the end of 2 Kings. The events recorded in 2 Kings cover a period of 308 years. That's according to Archbishop Usher. All right, here's the introduction. Prominent throughout the book of 2 Kings is the wrath of God. Now, I said the theme is the judgment of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. is very prominent when you read 2 Kings. Just can't, can't get away from it. Israel and Judah both disobeyed God and were taken into captivity. Now, I believe that God judged Israel first because they were much worse, obviously. Um, for example, there was not one good king in Israel. They were all bad whereas at least Judah had a few good kings. And I think the captivity of Israel was a warning to Judah. In other words, this could happen to you. But I guess Judah didn't pay attention to that, and they eventually went into captivity also. And you know what happened. The temple was destroyed. The city was, was uh, invaded and so on. So Israel and Judah both disobeyed God, and they were taken into captivity. Israel by the Assyrians, that's recorded in chapter 17, and then later on Judah was taken into captivity by the Chaldeans. That's in chapter 25. Israel and Judah have been warned many times by the prophets. All right, everybody mentioned that, uh, but they would not listen. We've already read 2 Kings 17, verses 13 and 14. Let's look at verse 15. 2 Kings 17, verse 15 says, And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers, and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images. So they practiced idolatry. Even two calves and made a grove and worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. So they were so backslidden they were worshiping the heathen deity Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. In other words, that's human sacrifice. And used divination, because that's witchcraft and so on, sorcery. They used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So, again, that was a warning to Judah that your turn is going to come too if you don't repent. But Judah did not repent and Judah eventually went into captivity also. All right, number three is a quote from the uh, Bible teacher, J. Vernon McGee. 
McGee said, the moral teaching of these books, meaning First and Second Kings, is to show man his inability to rule himself and the world. In these four historical books, First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, we get a very graphic view of the rise and fall of the kingdom of Israel. And it's interesting, McGee says it shows man's inability to rule himself in the world. Well, we can apply that to America, uh, the greatest country in the world. But if America continues to turn away from God, I don't see anything but judgment ahead. I don't see how we can survive the judgment of God if we continue going in the wrong direction. And of course, we see all the turmoil going on in the country today. Uh, I would think that would be a wake-up call for us Christians to pray for our country, pray for our president. Uh, I don't know how many Christians are really taking this thing seriously and praying about it. It's a real problem we're seeing today, and it's going to take more than politics to fix this mess we're in right now. America needs to turn back to God. All right, here's an outline. First, Elijah and Elisha. Those are two famous prophets. Uh, Elijah was the mentor of Elisha. Second Kings begins with Elijah's rebuke of King Ahaziah, who was the king of Israel. That's recorded in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, we have Elijah's translation into heaven. That's, of course, one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. Uh, we have a few minutes. We can look at that. Uh, that's uh, a story even unsaved people are somewhat familiar with. And, of course, that famous song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and so on. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal, and Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elijah said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Verse 4, And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view far off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And that's a really remarkable uh, thing he said, I believe. A double portion of thy spirit. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and part of them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it. So that means he got the double portion that he asked for. Of course, we know that spirit is the Holy Spirit. And uh, if you study the life of Elijah, he did twice as many miracles as Elijah. He asked for a double portion. And I think that's only part of it, really. His ministry lasted a lot longer than Elijah's ministry, too. But anyway, Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, a chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took, them, took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Now, um, Elijah never died. He went directly up into heaven. And that's why some people think uh, when you get to the book of Revelation, there's two witnesses uh, that one of them is going to be Elijah. Could be. I, I tend to believe that myself. I wouldn't be dogmatic about it because the Bible doesn't clearly say so, but could be. Certainly sounds like Elijah. All right, let's move on now. Number three, Elisha had a much longer ministry than Elijah, all the way from chapter 2 to chapter 13. He dominates chapters 2 to 9. In other words, he's a major figure in those chapters. 
His death and final miracle, which took place after his death, are recorded in 2 Kings 13. Now, it's interesting. Elijah, everybody knows about Elijah, but Elijah is not quite as well known. But Elisha also had a very colorful ministry, a very fascinating ministry, and he, a longer ministry uh, than his uh, mentor Elijah. Let's look at his last miracle, which I think is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. 2 Kings 13, 2 Kings 13. And verse number 20. 2 Kings 13, verse number 20. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And, then when, and when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Now, that is a <laughs> wonderful story, amazing story. And some would say, you really believe that? I believe everything in the Bible. So I believe this story, too. His last miracle he performed after he was dead. You think about that. Well, that's the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. Number two, the kings of Israel. As I said earlier, uh, all of the kings of Israel, without exception, were bad. Not one of them uh, was uh, a good king. Uh, not one of them was saved. They were all ungodly men. The kings of Judah were different. There were some good ones there, like Hezekiah and Josiah and so on, Jehoshaphat. There were some good kings in Judah, but Israel, unfortunately, not one of them was any good. Now, let's look at the outline here. One, King Ahab, because he was the worst of the worst. King Ahab was succeeded by his son Ahaziah. King Ahaziah's death is recorded in chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. His brother Jehoram, sometimes referred to as Joram, succeeded him. King Jehoram was killed by Jehu, the captain of his army. Now, Jehu uh, is one of the most fascinating characters in uh, Second Kings, for sure. Uh, the Lord used Jehu as his instrument of wrath and judgment against the house of King Ahab and against Baal worship. But King Jehu himself was not a believer, which makes it so fascinating that he was used mightily by the Lord to execute judgment uh, against King Ahab and against all of the pervasive Baal worship that was going on uh, in Israel. And by the way, that Baal worship was largely because of the leadership of King Ahab. He and Jezebel were promoting Baal worship. They were trying to make Baal worship the official religion of Israel. And they would have succeeded, I believe, had it not been for Elijah. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 28. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 28. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Howbeit, from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well, and executing that which is right in mine eyes, and has done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Now that's interesting. God blessed him in some ways. He, he used him as his instrument of judgment. He told him, your, your, your children are going to, be kings of Israel to the fourth generation because you obeyed me. But yet, it says here uh, in verse 29, he um, made no uh, effort to serve the Lord. He, it says here, he, um, howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made us of the sin, Jehu departed not. He discontinued uh, living a worldly, godless life, uh, even though uh, he was used by the Lord in a marvelous way to wipe out Baal worship uh, in Israel. All right, let's move on here. Uh, number four, Jehu's son Jehoahaz succeeded him, chapter 13. He was followed by his son Jehoash. After his death, the king, after the death of King Jehoash, his son Jeroboam II. Now, of course, the first king of the divided kingdom was Jeroboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son, and during his reign, the kingdom was divided, and Jeroboam was the first king of the divided Israel. Jeroboam 
um, was the first king of Israel after the division. And Jeroboam, I mean, um, Re Rehoboam, Solomon's son, was the king of Judah after the division. But anyway, this one is called Jeroboam II to distinguish him from the first king of Israel, Jeroboam. All right. Um, number seven, he, uh, all right, we already did number six. He reigned, uh, chapter 14, verse 16. Then number seven, Jeroboam II was followed by his son, Zechariah. Of course, that's a popular name in the Bible. Quite a few men by that name, including the prophet Zechariah. And they got John the Baptist's father, Zechariah. But Jeroboam II was followed by his son, Zechariah. He reigned for only six months, and he was killed by Shalom. Shalom reigned for only one month. Boy, that was a pretty short reign. And he was killed by uh, Menahem. You can see the decline of Israel. You see uh, these kings all kept killing each other. They had short reigns. Uh, was, you can see, not a very pretty picture. Uh, you can see it's all starting to fall apart. Um, number nine, he reigned for 10 years. That's pretty long considering some of the others. And after his death, his son Pekaniah became king. He reigned for only two years. He was killed by Pekah. Notice how many were kept getting assassinated. One after the other kept getting killed. Uh, so um, he was, Pekaniah was killed by one of his captains named Pekah. Pekah reigned for 20 years. That's pretty long considering some of the others. And he was killed by Hosea. Hosea reigned for nine years. He paid tribute money to Shalmaneser, the king of Syria. When Shalmaneser discovered that King Hosea was not paying him tribute money, but was conspiring with the king of Egypt, he invaded Israel and put Hosea in prison. And that basically was the end of the nation of Israel. That's how it all came to an end. And they went into captivity and so on. And by the way, when they went into captivity, they never came back. Now, when Judah went into captivity, a small remnant came back, you know, in the days of Nehemiah and so on. But when Israel went into captivity, they never came back. They intermarried with the heathens. And when you get to the New Testament, you have the Samaritans who were basically, uh, you know, mixed, mixed breed. They were part Israel and part heathen and so on. And their religion reflected that. Their religion was kind of a hodgepodge of some true worship of Jehovah God and some heathenism mixed in our Lord told the woman at the well that, you know, he rebuked her for her, uh, tried to correct her for her false doctrine. All right, so that's the end of Israel. Number three, Roman number three, king of Ju kings of Judah. Ahaziah was the son of King Jehoram. Ahaziah was a bad king, like his father. King Ahaziah was killed by Jehu. Now, you said that Jehu was only going after the bad kings of Israel. Yes, but... Um, he went after him because he was related to King Ahab by marriage. Of course, back in those days, a lot of that going on. Different kings would marry their sons off to daughters and so on. And in fact, that's how the whole mess started with King Solomon. He started marrying heathen wives, and, and, uh, and that's how it all started. He married the daughters of some heathen kings, and, and his wives led him into idolatry, and that's how the whole thing started falling apart. But anyway... Uh, so, so King Azahiah was killed by Jehu because he was related to King Ahab by marriage. We can look at that. Why don't we? Uh, chapter 9, verse 27. Chapter 9, verse 27. But when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up. By, Jehu was a hard man, by the way. He was... He was definitely a hard man. He was a soldier, and he was, he was uh, pretty rough. And they did so to the going up to Ger, which is by Ibleam, and he fled to Megiddo. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to be fought. And he died there, okay? Um, in fact, we should go back a little bit. Uh, let me see. Well, we'll look at the rest later. We can just read verse 28. And his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in the sepulcher which his fathers in the, with, the, with his fathers in the city of David. All right? In the 11th year of Joram, the son of Ahab became uh, as Haziah to reign over Judah. Okay, so that's uh, the death of King uh, Haziah, who was killed by Jehu. Uh, next page. Next page, number two. After killing King Haziah, Jehu killed all of his brothers. Again, like I said, Jehu was uh, a rough character, and uh, he, uh, he was a violent man. Look at chapter 10, verse 13. And Jehu met with the brethren of Haziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are ye? 
And they answered, we are the brethren of Haziah, and we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And he said, take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and 40 men. Neither left he any of them. So all 42 were killed uh, under the orders of Jehu. Now, when you get to chapter 11, verse 1, this is a very important verse uh, in the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings 11, 1, and when Athaliah, who was the mother of King Haziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. That's a nice mom right there, huh? When she sees that her son is dead, she killed off all the rest of the royal seed. Uh, but Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Haziah, took Joash, the son of Haziah, and stole him from among the king's sons. In other words, she hid, she hid that little fella, uh, Joash, a little boy at the time, and she protected him and hid him uh, from the king's mother, Athaliah, who was killing off all the other seed royal. Anyway, so she took Joash and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain, and they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah so that he was not slain. And he was with her, hid in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. So after she killed off everybody, she made herself queen. Uh, but fortunately, uh, Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, hid uh, little Joash. That's a really uh, fascinating story right there. Uh, number four, number four in the outline, Joash's great uncle, the high priest Jehoiada, brought him forth when he was seven years old. So Joash became king when he was seven years old. Now you say, how can a seven-year-old be a king? Well, obviously he had a lot of help from Jehoiada. Jehoiada was guiding him, instructing him, and helping him, and so on. So he brought him forth when he was seven years old and had him crowned and anointed king. Wicked Queen Athaliah was taken by surprise. She didn't expect that. She didn't even know he was alive. She didn't realize that uh, she thought she killed everybody. And she didn't know that Joash was still alive. And she was taken by surprise when she heard the people clapping their hands and shouting, God save the king. And when she appeared in the temple to challenge the coup, Jehoiada commanded her to be taken out of the temple and executed. So Jehoiada, even though he was a high priest, he was a, a strong man. And he knew the only way to deal with someone like this wicked queen was have her executed. Otherwise, there'd be more trouble from her. So he had her executed. And rightly so. She was a... Uh, a murderer. She murdered all those uh, descendants of the king. All right, so that's uh, the story of how Joash became uh, king. That's the story of how Athaliah was killed. Number five, King Joash was a good king. He's considered one of the better kings, and he reigned for 40 years. Now, again, the, some of the kings of Judah were good kings, including Joash. He reigned for 40 years, according to chapter 12, verse 1. Now, here's the thing about Joash. As long as Jehoiada the priest was around to advise him, he did well. But when Jehoiada died, King Joash lost his way. Now, that is an important lesson because I've seen that a few times myself over the years. Some people do very well as long as there's somebody kind of guiding them and directing them and helping them. But when that person's out of the way, whether, usually when they die is what it is, then the person kind of goes their own direction. They needed that person in their life to kind of direct them. And that, apparently that was the case with Joash. He did very well because of the strong influence, the godly influence of high priest Jehoiada. But when Jehoiada died, Joash started going the wrong direction. And we can see that recorded in uh, 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 2. 2 Kings 12, 2. Jehoash, let's go back to verse 1. Let's go back to verse 1. Here, Je Jehoash is called Je Jehoash, same, same person. And they live, in the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign, that's Joash. And 40 years, I mentioned, he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, all his days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. See that? That's significant, that phrase. He did well wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him, because Jehoiada was instructing him guiding him, advising him, helping him, strengthening him. But when Jehoiada died, then Joash lost his way. And again, I've seen that a few times over the years with different individuals and, or read about different people. Uh, let's go to uh, 
Sec, keep your place in 2 Kings. We'll be right back in, in a minute, but go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, chapter 24. 2 Chronicles 24. We'll get into 1 Chronicles next week, Lord willing. But right now, we're going to jump ahead and go to 2 Chronicles, chapter 24, and verse 15. 2 Chronicles 24, verse 15. But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died, 130 years old when he died. So that's why he was able to help King uh, Joash for such a long time, because he lived to be an old man, lived to be 130. And so he was around a long time helping the king, but he eventually died, verse 15. Verse 16, they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel. In other words, he was a good and godly man. Did good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. Now after, look at verse 17, now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made, made obeisance to the king, then the king hearkened unto them. See, that was a mistake. See, if Jehoiada was alive, he would have told them, stay away from those princes, they're up to no good. But now that the Jehoiada was dead, these princes saw an opportunity to influence the king, and that's what happens, you see? People either influence us for good or bad. And some people, unfortunately, let the bad people influence them. Verse 18, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for, for, their, for this their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them. So God was patient with them. He sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. They wouldn't listen to the prophets. They ignored the prophets. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. This is Jehoiada's son now, who was also a prophet, uh, a priest rather, but the Spirit of God came upon him. Uh, and he stood above the people, and he said unto them, Thus saith, saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath forsaken you. So Jehoiada, the priest, his son, Zechariah, warned them and said, Why are you doing this? If you forsake the Lord, he's going to forsake you. You cannot prosper if you turn your back on God. Well, verse 21, what they do? They stoned him. They killed him. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment, notice that, at the commandment of the king. That's one of the saddest things in the Bible, I think. Jehoiada helped Joash for all those years. He was right by his side helping him and guiding him. In fact, Joash wouldn't have been king if it hadn't been for Jehoiada. He was only seven years old when they made him king because Jehoiada put him on the throne. And how does he pay back all that kindness? He kills his son. It's one of the saddest things in the Bible, I think. I mean, a lot of sad things in the Bible. This is one of the most saddest stories. At the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, the Lord, God upon, uh, the Lord look upon it and require it. Those are his, his final words before he died. What a sad, sad uh, story. Verse 23, And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him, and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus, for the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host. Notice the Lord did that. The Lord delivered a very great host into their hand, because they had forsaken the Lord God of the Father, so they executed judgment against Joash. I believe that there's a lot of lessons here uh, in these wonderful Old Testament stories. Verse 25, And when they departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him. What a way to die. His own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest and slew him on his bed and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the kings. In other words, they wouldn't give him a, a royal burial. They wouldn't bury him with the other kings because they were showing their displeasure at what he had done after Jehoiada died. And these are they that conspired against him. Zabad, the son of Shimeath and uh, Ammonitus and Jehoshaphat, the son of Shimrith, uh, Moabitus, not concerning his sons and the greatness of his burdens laid upon him and the repairing of the house of God, behold, they are written in the story of the book of the kings, and Amaziah his son reigned in his stead. All right, let's move on. Uh, number six, after Joash was killed by his servants, Amaziah his son reigned in his stead. He was a good king. 
So even though Joash turned the wrong way in his later years, thank God his son was a good king, he also was killed by the conspirators, and his son Azariah, also known as Uzziah, was put on the throne by the people of Judah. Now, Uzziah, of course, was a good king also, well-known king. He was a close associate of Isaiah the prophet and so on. So Amaziah was killed. His son Azariah, also known as Uzziah, was put on the throne, chapter 14. King Uzziah was a good king, and he reigned for 52 years. That's a lengthy reign right there, yeah? 52 years he was a king. He was followed by his son Jotham, who was also a good king. So he had a pretty good str string there of good kings, one after the other. It wasn't always like that. Sometimes a good king followed by a bad king, followed by a good king. But he had a whole, several good kings in a row. Um, number 10, here's when the, here's when the, the uh, string of good kings came to an end. Number 10, after four good kings, they had the son of Jotham became, became king, and he was a bad king, chapter 16. After Ahaz, his son Hezekiah became king. Hezekiah was a great king. And he was a very good king. It was a great revival under the leadership of King Hezekiah, recorded in 2 Kings chapter 18. So Hezekiah was one of the best kings they had. Uh, he was followed by Manasseh, who was a wicked king. There we go again, a good king followed by a bad king followed by a good king. So Manasseh was a bad king. And King Manasseh's provocations were the main reason Judah went into captivity. Look at chapter 23, verse 26. Chapter 23, 2 Kings... Go back to 2 Kings uh, 23 and look at verse number 26. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight. From that point on, it was all over for Judah. Even though they had some more kings and they had a good king with uh, Josiah and so on, but the Lord had already said, it's, 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 that's it. I'm going to remove Judah out of my sight, just like I removed Israel, and will cast off this city of Jerusalem. He's going to say, Jerusalem's no longer going to be a great city. He's going to cast off Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. And it's because of the provocations of, of um, what's his name, Manasseh. Now, what's interesting about Manasseh uh, if you look at, uh, well, go to chapter 24, verse 3. Surely the command of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for all the sins, for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. So Manasseh was a wicked king, and his provocations were the main reason that Judah was sent into captivity and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and so on, and the temple was destroyed. However, Second King, I mean Second Chronicles, bottom of the page here, bottom of, the, of, the, of your notes, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11 to 13 says, he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. That's interesting. That, that conversion of Manasseh is not recorded in 2 Kings, but it is recorded in 2 Chronicles. He did repent. He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. That, to me, indicates that he did get right with God in his, in his last days. But nevertheless, the damage was done, and God's judgment was uh, irrevocable. Uh, it was too late to turn back now. All right, final page, final page. After the death of King Manasseh, his son Ammon became the king of Judah. That's recorded in chapter 21. He was a bad king. After the death of King Ammon, his son Josiah reigned in his stead. He was a very good king and the last good king of Judah. And uh, there's a lot of interesting stories regarding uh, Josiah. He turned the people back to God back to the word of God, and um, God really used King Josiah. But he had a very strange death. What I mean by that is he, he died on the battlefield of Megiddo. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to be fought. And uh, he had no business being there, in my opinion. Let's look at that. Uh, chapter 23 and verse 28 Chapter 23, verse 20. Now, the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria. Now, this wasn't his fight. You know, it was Assyria against Egypt. I don't know why he, you know, put himself involved in it, got himself involved in this thing. He wasn't really supposed to be there. But Pharaoh Necho, 
the king of Egypt went up against the king of Assyria to the, uh, to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. And he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. And his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher. And the people of the land took Joaz, the son of Joaz, Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's dead. Now, maybe there's more to the story than the Bible tells us. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But I never could figure out what, what he was doing there on that battlefield if the fight was between Egypt and Assyria. But anyway, that's where he died. He died on the battlefield. And um, number 15 in the notes, after the death of King Josiah, uh, his son Jehoahaz became king, but he reigned for only three months. He, as were all his successors, was a bad king. So that was the beginning of the end for Judah. In other words, Josiah was the last good king they had. Uh, and Pharaoh Necto uh, made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah, his father, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. And he took Jehoahaz away, for he came to Egypt and died there. Jehoiakim reigned for 11 years. After the death of Jehoiakim, his son Jehoiachin, they all kind of sound similar, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin. Uh, Jehoiachin reign, began to reign, and he reigned for only three months. It was during his reign that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and his army invaded Jerusalem. So if you want to get a time frame here, and that was probably one of the most uh, important events in the history of Israel and history of Judah, when Nebuchadnezzar and his army invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and ransacked the city and and so on. That was during uh, his reign, during the reign of Jeho uh, Jehoiachin. Um, king Nebuchadnezzar made Mataniah his father's brother king in his stead, and he changed his name to Zedekiah. King Zedekiah rebelled against Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem again. So there was more than one invasion. There were several of them. Uh, this time, in this particular invasion, is when he destroyed the temple and completely destroyed the city. Uh, that's recorded in 2 Kings 25. 2 Kings 25 is the last chapter in the book, and it gives us all of the sorry, sad uh, details here. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's 30 verses, but it talks about the army coming in, destroying the city, taking away the king. Look at verse 7. They slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah. Boy, that must have been a sad thing to see. Killed all his sons right before his eyes. And after they killed all his sons, he took out his eyes and bound them with fetters of brass and carried them to Babylon. And the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon unto Jerusalem, and he burnt the house of the Lord. That's a temple. Burned it down, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great man's house burned he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem. So they broke down all the walls surrounding the city. Verse 11, Now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the, and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude did uh, Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, carry away. So it's a sad story here, uh, and that's the end of uh, Judah. A few chapters earlier, we see the end of Israel, and here in chapter 25, we have the end of Judah. Now, First and Second Chronicles covers basically the same time period. Some information is given that we don't see in First and Second Kings, like I mentioned, Manasseh repenting and so on. There's other events recorded that First and Second Kings don't record. And then, of course, after Second Chronicles, we get to Ezra, and that's when the captivity was over and people started going back and so on. All right, well, that's it for Second Kings. Like I said, next week, Lord willing, we'll do uh, uh, First Chronicles. Lord bless you.